New ankylosaurs are always a good thing. They have one of the worst fossil records, maybe because their suits of armor fall apart and to the winds after they die. Maybe it's because they mostly preferred environments that were not conducive to fossil making. Or maybe it's a fossil finding bias and they are really all out there waiting to be found. Other times it's a collecting bias and there are more ankylosaurs in collections than people realize. One such case has just been described. Let's meet Vectibelta. Anyone who knows even the slightest about dinosaurs knows what an ankylosaur is. Well, they know what ankylosaurus is, but maybe not something as specific as the taxonomic label ankylosaur, ankylosauria, ankylosauridae, and so on. Ankylosaurus is the poster child of its group and why its group is named after it, so of course people know it. However, the entire group to which the big old pine cone belongs is far more diverse than its club carrying visage would have you believe. The entire group is characterized by having big wide bodies, short stubby limbs, and extensive arrays of bony armor on pretty much every single part of the body. They are walking coffee tables with sledgehammer or saw bladed tails. They are known from technically every continent, but are most common in North America, Asia, and Europe. These armored beasts are most closely related to the other armored dinosaur group, the stegosaurs, and split off from them at the end of the early Jurassic or the beginning of the middle Jurassic. They were very rare and a minor part of any ecosystem during the Jurassic but seized the armored dinosaur niche once the stegosaurs declined. The ankylosaurs really took off during the early Cretaceous. Europe has a very weird ankylosaurian fossil record. It's consistent, but pretty much every single one is either super fragmentary or just kind of okay. Then again, you can kind of say that about most of the European fossil record in general. For example, the original ankylosaur, Hylaeosaurus, is a jumble of a chunk of a specimen. Polacanthus became a wastebasket where all the other ankylosaur fragments found throughout England would be placed, with only the original bones being kept around for the single species known, a pelvic shield and some bits and bobs. You've got Sarcolestes from the Oxford clay, represented by some teeth and a jaw. I did say Europe, so I will give you the rest of the European ankylosaurs. There is Struthiosaurus from Austria, Romania, France, and Hungary, mostly based on very fragmentary and near indeterminate material, though some better partial skeletons have been found in the 150 or so years since its discovery. There's Hungarosaurus from Hungary, known from a fairly good but still relatively fragmentary skeleton and three other specimens. Probably one of the best true ankylosaurs from Europe is the Spanish Europelta, known from most of the skeleton. The best armored dinosaur known from Europe is definitely Scalidosaurus, which is known from a bunch of specimens, becoming a wastebasket name for well over a hundred years, but still containing a specimen that is essentially the entire animal with its armor still attached to its body. Unfortunately, it's an exceedingly early armored dinosaur and not particularly closely related to stegosaurs nor ankylosaurs, so it does not offer much with regard to the ecology and evolution of true ankylosaurs in the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous, and late Cretaceous of Europe. All that being said, the UK still seems to be the most consistent source of European ankylosaur material. It's just a lot of eh fossils that cannot be named. Despite not being nameable, they do still act as data. A lot of this miscellaneous material comes from a chunk of rock called the Weldon Group. Although poorly dated, the Weldon Group of the Isle of Wight spans the Barimian and Lower Aptian, a time period of at least 8 million years and perhaps significantly longer. As I stated earlier, a lot of paleontologists in the last 100 years have just assumed every ankylosaur bit falling out of the UK, specifically this Weldon group, belongs to the Polacanthus genus. But this approach is probably obscuring the true ankylosaurian diversity of the region during the early Cretaceous. Same thing happens with the Isle of Wight's Iguanodontian fossils. Well, actually the same thing has been happening with the majority of English dinosaur fossils, but I digress. There is a suggested mass extinction that occurred between the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. But the really bad fossil record of the early Cretaceous across the world is not helping understand if there really was a mass extinction. 
I mean, there sure seems to have been something like one, with the extinction of many of the long-necked dinosaur groups, the primitive ornithopods, the stegosaurs, and early ceratosaurs. A lot of new groups popped up in the early Cretaceous and went on to become the main dinosaur groups till their end. Your Tyrannosaurs, Velosaurs, Carcharodontosaurs, Elaphrosaurs, Ankylosaurs, Hadrosaurs, Titanosaurs, and Ceratopsians. There is a lot of new research being done on early Cretaceous dig sites to try to get a handle on this transitional period, so it's just a matter of time, but it's slow going and the picture is still not super clear. The Weldon Group, deposited from the Valanginian to Aptian, is one of the few dinosaur-bearing rock sequences worldwide that fills this gap, and thus an accurate understanding of its dinosaur diversity and distribution through time is crucial if there is ever going to be some light shed on the purported end Jurassic extinction event and how fauna has recovered following it. Which finally brings us to a new study published by Stuart Pond, Sarah Jane Strachan, Thomas Raven, Martin Simpson, Kirsty Morgan, and Susanna Maidment in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology in June of 2023 that describes a brand new ankylosaur from this chunk of time that helps fill in a gap in ankylosaur evolution. The new ankylosaur, specimens IWCMS 1996.153 and IWCMS 2021.75 was found approximately 50 meters to the west of Chilton Chine, in an area which forms part of the Compton Chine to Steep Hill Cove site of special scientific interest, the Compton to Atherfield Geological Conservation Review Site, and the Isle of Wight area of outstanding natural beauty. It has a long history, which is best told by the authors of the paper. So, as they state, several backbones belonging to the new ankylosaur were collected from the beach in November of 1993 by Gavin Leng, and he later donated them to the collections of Dinosaur Isle Museum. This material is ascensioned with the number IWCMS 1996.153. The remainder of the skeleton was found by Lynn Spearpoint in March or April of 1994 in cliffs belonging to Richard Fisk. Richard Fisk gave permission for Lynn Spearpoint, Dick Spearpoint, and Martin Simpson to excavate and acquire the specimen. Due to the logistical difficulties of working with tides, poor weather, and on land slipped ground, no complete quarry map was made, but photographs were taken. Simpson noted that the skeleton lay with its front facing out to sea, and the back vertebrae were scattered in this area. The pelvis was upside down, indicating that the specimen was probably lying with its top surface downwards. The largest spines were located near the front of the animal. The tail vertebrae were associated but not fully articulated. The specimen was acquired by the Dinosaur Isle Museum in November of 2021 and given the ascension number IWCMS 2021.75. So, they decided to name the animal Vectipelta baratai. Vectipelta is derived from the Roman name for the Isle of Wight, Vectis, and Pelta, meaning shield in Latin referring to the characteristic dermal armor. Baratai is in honor of Professor Paul Barrett in recognition of his major and ongoing contributions to dinosaurian vertebrate paleontology. All told, the specimen totals a partial skeleton containing neck, back, hip, and tail vertebrae, fragmentary pelvic girdle, and limb elements, and numerous osteoderms. When all of the bones were put together and the missing bones were filled in with the rules of symmetry and from close relatives, this is what you get. A very wide set animal with a suit of rounded and keeled bony armor plates across the neck, shoulders, back, sides, belly, and tail. A huge set of fused bony armor sits over the pelvis like a shield and rings of tall pointy armor cover the transition between the neck and shoulders as well as fringe the sides of the animal and edge of its tail. Vectipelta had short, robust limbs to carry its bulk, and a short, white skull for cropping, lightly chewing, and swallowing huge amounts of plant materials, as well as the occasional proteinous snack. Before we move on to what kind of ankylosaur Vectipelta was, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a better idea of what size the beast was when compared to the horrible hairless apes that control the planet today. When everything is filled in and some quick maths are done, it seems as though this individual of Vectipelta may have measured about 3.5 meters or 11.5 feet in length, making it on the smaller side of ankylosaurs. Though this is sort of average for notosaur type ankylosaurs. 
When the team tallied up all of the anatomical traits of Vectipelta, put them into the phylogenetic software of their choosing, and compared that data with data already collected on other known ankylosaurian dinosaurs, the team were able to figure out a probable phylogeny of the animal. Vectipelta was found to be very closely related to Zhejiangosaurus and Dongyangopelta, all three of which form their own group together. This group was found to cluster most closely to another group containing Shamosaurus, Zarapelta, Euoplocephalus, Cychania, Jinyunpelta, Ankylosaurus, and more. This is unusual as the second group contains Ankylosaurid Ankylosaurs, the chubs with clubs. Meanwhile, Vectipelta, Zhejiangosaurus, and Zhongyangpelta all seem to be most like the clubless, salt-tailed Notosaurs and Polycanthine Ankylosaurs. What makes this even weirder though is that the actual Polycanthus as well as Hylaeosaurus, both of which are from the same Welton group chunk of rock as Vectipelta, were found to be each other's closest relatives and to belong to the Polycanthine group of Ankylosaurs. This means they were not closely related despite having generally similar body plans. The close association between Vectipelta and the two Chinese Ankylosaurs, Zhejiangosaurus and Dongyongpelta, is weird, right? Unfortunately, the Chinese Ankylosaurs have some strange anatomy of their own, making their own taxonomic identity hard to pin down, making this whole mess provisional. Their relatedness is perhaps surprising given a minimum 16 million year gap between them, plus one being European and the others being Chinese. A close similarity in the animals between Europe and North America in the early Cretaceous has previously been hypothesized, with the Ankylosaurs of the Weldon group and the North American Gastonia and Hoplitosaurus, among others, being considered closely related. All of this is supported by hypothesized geography. A land bridge is suggested to have connected Newfoundland and Iberia in the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. What isn't as well documented is a faunal interchange between Europe and Asia, despite being neighbors, of course. Another land bridge may have connected Europe and Asia at the time, which were mostly not as connected as they are today. However, it is also possible that the similarities found by the team between Vectipelta and the Chinese ankylosaurs were false positives from two fragmentary remains. Indeed, given the taxonomic debate surrounding the two Chinese ankylosaurs, more work is clearly needed in understanding their anatomy and evolution. Three ankylosaurs are now known from the Weldon group of southern England, Hylaeosaurus from the Valanginian Grinstead clay formation of Sussex, and Polycanthus and Vectipelta from the Berimian Wessex formation of the Isle of Wight. The Barimian to Aptian boundary is thought to lie within the Vectus formation, which overlies the Wessex formation, while the oldest Wessex deposits exposed on the island are Lower Barimian. The exact duration of the exposed Wessex formation on the Isle of Wight is unknown, but the holotype of Polycanthus was found at Barnes High in some of the youngest Wessex sediments exposed and is likely to be late Barimian in age. In contrast, Vectipelta, found in plant debris bed L5 at Chilton Shine, was found close to the base of the exposed Wessex formation on the island, and therefore is early Barimian in age. It is likely that Vectipelta and Polacanthus were separated by 6 to 8 million years, while Hylaeosaurus was older still by at least 3 million years. The fauna of the Weldon group is often divided into a lower Weldon fauna and an upper Weldon fauna but new discoveries, including Vectipelta and the recently named Iguanodontian Brystonius, indicate that the situation is actually far more complex. The upper Weldon fauna comprises animals that may have been separated in time by as much as the period of time between the late Miocene and today. New stratigraphical work and examination of historical specimens in museum collections will no doubt reveal a hidden diversity of dinosaurs from throughout this temporal window. Anecdotally, ankylosaurs found in the Wessex Formation are usually called Polycanthus without reference to specific traits, but it is clear that this practice among collectors and within museum catalogues has meant that important variation has been overlooked and has led to the true diversity of ankylosaurs in the Weldon being hidden. Only time will tell quite how diverse the ankylosaurs were in early Cretaceous England. 
For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.